Airing on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week on the show, we're airing two portions. First up, you'll hear Charlotte speaking about their friend, political prisoner, and water defender, Jessica Reznicek, who just had an appeal denied on an eight-year sentence and terrorism enhancement for sabotaging the Dakota Access Pipeline with another Catholic worker prior to Dapple carrying oil. It's estimated that the two Catholic workers cost $6 million in lost profits to energy transfer partners and stopped the flow of 30 million barrels of oil. For this portion, we talk about the Dakota Access Pipeline, the movements that Jessica was involved in, including occupying the Catholic workers, the increased criminalization of dissent as the climate heats up, and how to support Jessica and spread the good word. You can learn more about Jess and her case at support Jessica Reznicek, that's R-E-Z-N-I-C-E-K dot com. Then we do something a little experimental. We present a conversation with a member of an anti-authoritarian movement in Europe. We don't say what movement. We talk about conflict internal to their movement, but we don't name the parties involved. The conversation was conducted from an anti-authoritarian perspective in the interest of creating heterogeneous communities of struggle. The purpose of this recording is to promote a mental exercise on the part of the listener to plug in their own experiences in movements with many different trajectories inside of them. The anonymous nature of the conversation was in part to not contribute to internal conflict in that movement. Conflict is better addressed between parties involved than with an outside party or radio show whose interests may not be the same as the movement. I hope this conversation is helpful for all of its purposeful anonymity and vagueness. Could you please introduce yourself with any name, preferred pronouns, affiliations, anything like that that you want to share? Sure. I'm Charlotte. I use she, they pronouns, and I am a member of the Free Jess team. So we're going to be talking about Jessica Reznicek, a Catholic worker, land and water defender facing eight years in prison for sabotaging the Dakota Access Pipeline without causing a drop of spillage and you know, succeeding in losing energy transfer partners uh, a good amount of money, which is pretty awesome. First up, I wanted to ask if you'd mind sharing how you became a supporter of Jessica, if you come from prisoner support world or eco defense support or, or yeah, how you came to this. Yeah, I met Jess in Iowa. Um, I had spent time at Standing Rock and then things were getting so militarized and crazy. And I heard that they needed extra hands. Like there's a small scrappy group in Iowa. So I went down there and that's where I met her. We were part of the same direct action caravan called Mississippi Stand. And Jess had really kind of started the resistance movement to the Dakota Access Pipeline DAPL um, in Iowa most people think of Dapple with Standing Rock, but um, the pipeline also went through, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and then there is the end in Illinois. So she really kind of galvanized the Iowa base to care about this pipeline and its, you know, pollution into the waters there. And um, so, yeah, that's where I met her. And then just personally, I've been doing climate justice work pretty much since Standing Rock. And so that was a big moment for me personally and, you know, do direct action, do prison support of different kinds. And I'm an abolitionist. So for, for me with Jess, there's a lot of things that intersect. And at the end of the day, just being her friend and not wanting her to be locked up and wanting to support her and, you know, share the pieces of this, fight and legal situation that we're all really kind of terrified about. Can you tell us a bit about Jessica's story, like who she is and how she approaches political engagement? Like just a quick aside, uh, you know, before we talked, one of the things that I just very basically did was to look at the Wikipedia about Jessica. And there's just so much stuff in there. Um, like she's so active. She has been so active and I'm sure she keeps it up, you know, even from behind bars. But yeah, if you could you tell us a bit about your friend, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So Jess grew up in Iowa, has a really deep connection to the waters there. And I think her actions were 
you know, definitely motivated from that place of just holding those waters really sacred to her. And she, I think like the very formative political moment for her was being involved in Occupy, you know, about 10 years ago. She was really involved with that. She is really involved with the anti-nuclear movement and doing a lot of actions against the proliferation of nuclear missiles. And um, she is an active member of the Catholic Workers Movement, which is a really big part of who she is. And also the, you know, within that, the plowshare movement and that kind of flavor of direct action. And, you know, she is also someone who, you know, is really place-based. Like I was really struck by her, to her connection of place to Iowa and connection to the rivers and really forming these relationships with kind of everyday farmers and residents and people on the street. Like this was very much not an echo chamber kind of vibe that, you know, I think different mm, political moments like Occupy, you know, like a lot of people there were already radicalized or, we're talking within circles, but she, to me, what I saw was always kind of like reaching across and finding ways to bring people in and educate them on these really, these really oppressive systems. So we've featured the voice of folks involved in Catholic worker struggles in the past uh, on the show a few times, like actually had Martha Hennessy of the Kings Bay Plowshare 7, Comrade Tail Moon had passed us um, audio of an interview with Martha before Martha went inside. But I must admit, the movement, it's its kind of marginal, is a lot of people have not heard of them. I grew up Roman Catholic and to Catholic par- had Catholic parents, but I only learned about them, uh, the Catholic worker movement, because of things like the SF Bay Area Book Fair having its pre-book fair cafe fundraiser at a Catholic worker space in San Francisco in the late 90s, early 2000s, or from stories from Utah Phillips, the musician and storyteller of his teacher, Eamon Hennessy. Now, I know the Plashers movement has uh, has had a long direct action history adjacent to or yeah, connected to the Catholic workers. Could you, Would it be possible for you to give a little intro to the milieu that Jessica came out of? And would you say some words about the Catholic worker movement? Yeah, sure. So the Catholic Worker Movement, it was created in the 1930s. You know, Dorothy Day and Peter Marin are kind of the two, I don't know if officially founders, but those are really big figures in the early days. And a lot of their tactics and approach to injustice is focused around uh, nonviolence, service, um, kind of redistributing wealth and resources. This was started with people feeling really uh, disenfranchised from the industrialization of Europe and especially a lot of young workers and seeing those inequalities rise really drastically during that time and really serving those kind of on the margins of society. And so they're also very anti-war. And so a lot of their actions are focused around service. There's you know, I don't know if they use the words mutual aid, but it's very mutual aid in orientation about just supplying basic needs to people and making sure those resources get to folks. Um, So a lot of the different regional houses, you know, they have kitchens, which was definitely a part of Jess's life for years in Iowa, in Des Moines, in the Catholic Workers House there. They feed a lot of houseless folks and uh, really whoever just wants some free food. So yeah, a lot of distribution of wealth, a lot of service, uh, sacrifice and worship are also pretty big parts of that. And I guess that sort of strain connects to the plowshare movement. And that that's another, I guess it's a little bit more specific. And that's, you know, part of the Christian pacifist movement. They're very anti-nukes and they really came about in... The 80s, there was, as you mentioned, you know, the Plowshare 7, there was the Berrigan brothers and some other folks that, you know, they got their name, they beat swords into plowshares and went into, you know, trespass allegedly um, into this place where missiles were made and they like poured blood on the documents and offered prayers for peace. Those kind of actions, you know, of 
like sacrificing themselves to kind of highlight this injustice and this issue is very much what they're known for. A lot of times it's also oriented around prayer. And that is also something that Jessica, you know, really related to. And I think for her, she joined the Dakota Access Pipeline struggle and Standing Rock. I think like the overlap was prayer and, you know, she was really standing in solidarity with a lot of indigenous communities that where their resistance was rooted in prayer and this like deep connection to the earth and integrity and a sense of what's right and being on the right side of history. So I think for Jess, the, you know, indigenous sovereignty and Catholic workers movement kind of for her had that kind of overlap. And then obviously the direct action piece is a really big part of the plowshare and Catholic workers movement as well. Well, as a reminder for folks, especially as, you know, younger folks are always joining the movement, we hope. Uh, the struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline was huge. It was it was bringing together a moment of bringing together indigenous sovereignty, climate justice, direct action, and land and water defense, as well as anti-capitalist activity against a lot of the banks investing in this mega project. And it was eventually completed and you know, uh, oil is flowing through it. But I'm wondering if you could, since as someone who was involved in that struggle, um, if you could sort of like give listeners a sense of what was going on at that time and, and your experience of it a bit. The Dakota Access Pipeline for those, you know, just basically it's about a 1200 mile pipeline from North Dakota uh, that ends in Illinois. And, you know, it has the name Standing Rock because it was on and next to the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, but it also went through a lot of other land. And it just became, it just kind of burgeoned into this enormous movement and became this really big flashpoint, as you mentioned, for climate justice, anti-fossil fuel work, indigenous rights, sovereignty, decolonization. I think, you know, the land back movement, like a lot of seeds were really planted for that there. And I think a lot of people just really, you know, it's hard to predict when these moments will happen, but a lot of people really resonated with the injustices that were happening. And, you know, one of the main things was that the pipeline was, you know, originally supposed to go through, you know, a more populous white town and it was rerouted in the permitting process because they realized it was so dangerous to go through the reservation. And then it ended up going through burial grounds that were very sacred and that just very clear, you know, environmental racism, I think just really struck a chord with a lot of people. And then, you know, a few people showed up and it, it grew to, you know, about 15,000 people showed up and, you know, lots of direct action. There was a ton of skill sharing. There was a lot of different camps there. And of course, like politics and different vibes with different camps, but there is definitely a strain of like self-sufficiency and autonomy and skill sharing in a lot of ways that I don't think a lot of people had experienced before that was really empowering. And I think it was this incredible moment for movement building and relationship building and really having a, a firm, like indigenous led decolonized resistance movement that was really rare, you know, and then you add the climate change piece on top of that and it really became this kind of lightning in a bottle moment for land defense and people banding together and doing these really enormous direct actions of a hundred or hundreds of people occupying sites where different construction equipment was doing at different stages of constructing a pipeline, like welding equipment together, boring under rivers, um, stringing pipe along, you know, digging underground, like people were interrupting that process and there was a range of how that was happening, you know, and sometimes people were occupying it and planting native seeds and there was song and prayer. And other times people were locking down to equipment to physically stop the construction from happening. And from that there, it led to enormous uh, costs for energy transfer partners, the pipeline company, or that owns the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so then they had to increase their private security costs. This also, we saw this huge increase in surveillance 
of resistance. And I would encourage folks to read the Intercepts articles on Tiger Swan. Their whole oil and water series covers this super in depth. And so that was this, you know, it was this brilliant moment of coming together and movement building. And then it also led to this and was, you know, this whole private security surveillance apparatus was also exposed. And the increase in the expenses for energy transfer partners led to a lot of banks to divest. So it also sparked the divestment movement. And people realize that these are investors realize that these are actually really risky financial operations or investments at this point. And um, we also saw in terms of, you know, suppression of protests, these critical infrastructure bills that came out of Standing Rock. So the oil and gas industry was really scared. And that's evidenced by the fact that they lobbied and put together a whole series of critical infrastructure bills after this that are now active in 15 states. That was a direct response to Standing Rock. And that makes, you know, it really elevates a lot of the charges associated with tampering with fossil fuel infrastructure. And so now trespassing, simple trespassing, which would otherwise be a misdemeanor, is now a felony in a lot of states and really up the ante on those charges And so a lot of things came out of that movement, like a lot of power and a lot of suppression as well. And I think what we're seeing with Jessica, um, you know, is a result of that fear from the oil and gas industry and this real desire to deter people from uh, trying to stop them. I think another set of laws that came out of the state's reaction to Standing Rock were these ones that decriminalized driving into crowds of people because there were such large marches or blockades of streets that they basically wanted to make sure that pipeline workers weren't going to get any charges for um, just forcing their way violently through a crowd of people in this huge metal object. Uh, Really scary. Yeah, totally. I mean, you think of the Charlottesville attack of Heather Heyer and it's not out of the question to think of someone plowing through a crowd with a car and killing someone like it happens. And exactly what you're saying, like bills like that, that decriminalize that kind of activity is directly tied or connected to this apparatus to deter people from any kind of resistance and fighting these systems of power. Could you say a little bit about what Jessica pled to and how she ended up um, getting caught and what she was convicted of and just as sort of the like nuts and bolts of of the case that the the U.S. um, government brought against her and and how she came to be labeled as a terrorist. Yeah, so Jessica um, acted in 2016 um, with another woman to disable pipeline equipment Uh, Yeah, and nobody was harmed. And then in 2017, they publicly admitted to this. And then three months later, Jess's home was raided by the FBI. And then there was this waiting period of two years before she was indicted by a federal grand jury on multiple charges. And then she was placed on house arrest. So there was this spooky like two year period that was really stressful, of course. And then this led to her sentencing hearing of June of 2021. And that's when she received the domestic terrorism enhancement and she pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to damage an energy facility. That was the only charge without a mandatory minimum. And she also has to pay 3.2 million to energy transfer partners in restitution. And then she will also be on supervised probation for three years. So how the, what was the second part of that? How the domestic terrorism label? Yeah. Yeah. Considering, I mean, you talked about the increased, the increased uh, penalties for things that would be considered necessary infrastructure or attacks on that, which you know, when I when I hear that at first, that makes me think of, oh, OK, yeah, because, for instance, foreign powers or 
uh, terrorist organization might try to take down the, you know, the electrical grid that could harm a lot of people. But like, how how did terrorism charges come into this? Is this like of the same? Is this a byproduct of? Well, I guess it wouldn't be a byproduct of those enhancements that you were talking about after the last question, because that was a state decision to talk about the the infrastructure. But it seems to be directly in the lineage of um, stuff that happened during the Green Scare from the late, like mid 90s up through the early 2000s, where um, terrorism enhancements, like for Marius Mason, for instance, were applied to nonviolent sabotage actions because they you know, for for things, for instance, like the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, you know, put in an enhancement at a federal level if anyone were to interfere or call for a boycott even of animal related industries. This kind of feels like it's in that vein. Is that a fair way to look at it? Or can you go into a little detail about that? Yeah, definitely. So we know exactly where the label of domestic terrorists for something like this started um, in 2017. 80 Republicans and four Democratic members of Congress pressed the Justice Department, asked uh, then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, to treat all people who tampered with fossil fuel infrastructure to label them as domestic terrorists. And they wrote this letter. So that's exactly where this started. This is a direct answer to that call. And that was in 2017. So that was in response to the Dakota Access Pipeline and the fear that the fossil fuel industry was feeling. And those Congress members together received a total combined $36 million in campaign contributions from the oil and gas industry. So this is, you know, this is being led by the oil and gas industry as a way to protect their assets. And that's one of the reasons why we're really scared about this, because we're seeing this collapse of the government and an oil and gas company. And then specifically the domestic terrorist label, it's really a sentencing guideline. And so it has to do with harming an individual, harming human life, like people like Timothy McVeigh, who killed 168 people. He is charged as a domestic terrorist. And then the specific clause that Jess's label rests on is whether or not she influenced the government. And it was the prosecutor back in her sentencing hearing that suggested that she was labeled as a terrorist. And her guideline for the charge that she admitted to, originally the sentencing guidelines range from 37 to 46 months. And then When Judge Rebecca Goodgame Ebinger um, responded to the prosecutor and applied this domestic terrorism label to Jess, and so that automatically increased increased her sentencing guidelines from the range of 37 to 46 months to 210 to 240 months. And that five-fold increase, you know, obviously has led to just being in in jail now for eight years was what she was sentenced for 96 months. And the judge Ebinger claimed that the lengthy sentence that she gave to Jessica was necessary to deter others. And you know, that, that is all on the record. Well, that leads me into this question. Yeah. So Jessica just lost a recent challenge in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals to the terrorism enhancement. Can you talk about this and what the next legal steps are for her? Yeah. So we were arguing in the appeal that the terrorism enhancement should be dropped and that would lead to a resentencing of her. And that definition of being a domestic terrorism, so that legal language hinges on whether or not the actions must be, quote, calculated to influence or affect the conduct of government by intimidation or coercion or to retaliate against government conduct. So we were arguing that her actions targeted a private company, not the government, and therefore this label was misapplied. And in the appeal decision that came out a few days ago on Monday, they Basically, they didn't go into the merits of whether the domestic terrorism label was accurate or not, but 
basically they said it's irrelevant and that any error was harmless. So um, this is like this harmless error is something that's used in courts a lot. And so they're basically saying that being labeled a domestic terrorism is irrelevant. She would have received the same sentencing either way, um, which isn't true. Her sentencing guidelines went from 37 to 46 months to 210 to 240 when she received that label. And so we're really worried about this for a lot of reasons. Number one is that those who critique the government can and the regulatory process can be labeled a domestic terrorist for critiquing the regulatory process. That is the prosecutor's justification. It's that Jess read her statement in front of the Iowa Utilities Board and in critiquing the regulatory process, which later was found by a federal judge to be illegal. It's an illegally operated pipeline at this point. And so Jess was right. You know, number one, that people who critique the regulatory process can be found as domestic terrorism. That's terrifying. And then number two is that judges can label a a land defender, a person, a domestic terrorist, and then go back and say it was a harmless error, that it was irrelevant to apply that label. So it's a pretty terrifying precedent that's being set. And, you know, we're, you know, being supported and, you know, talking a lot to different civil liberties groups who are really worried that this is, you know, this is not random. This is part of a much broader politically orchestrated set of decisions and, you know, bills with the critical infrastructure bills, the letter to Jeff Sessions, the funding of these Congress members, and then even, you know, the judges are Trump appointees, and they have a lot of ties to different, you know, big industries like pharmaceuticals and big ag. Um, And so, yeah, we're just really worried about this precedent this sets for a lot of activists, and this is part of a much broader, um, you know, movement to suppress protests, not just in the U.S., but um, internationally as well. So, I mean, to the question of what the next legal steps are, uh, you said that you, like, Jess's support has been talking to various um, civil liberties groups, but is is there a next legal step? Maybe I missed that in the answer. Uh, No, you didn't. Um, Yeah, the next legal step would be asking for a rehearing by the entire Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court, and or seeking presidential clemency. So we're figuring out what is next. Um, How can listeners help Jessica out at this point? And do you have any suggestions on how they can support the movements and activities that she put herself on the line for in moving forward? Like how can people continue to support indigenous sovereignty, land back, uh, stopping the destruction of the earth? Like how can they support water defense? That's wordy, but... I get it. Yeah, definitely. Great question. I mean, I think kind of big picture, I would urge people to examine their privilege, how high the stakes are. I think why Jess, in part why Jess did such a bold action like this, you know, was her connection to the waters, but it was also like trying to highlight how high do the stakes have to be where we act outside of the sanctioned forms of protests or resistance to the state, to capitalism, to the fossil fuel industry. You know, the appeal came out the same day that NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, they announced that carbon dioxide levels are now 50% higher than during the pre-industrial era and carbon dioxide has not been this high in 4 million years, and it's not dropping fast enough to avert catastrophe. You know, we all see wildfires, sea level rise, you know, all kinds of stuff from climate change. Like we know at this point it's real. And the state wants us to submit our comments to an environmental impact statement and then go back to our lives. And that's our only (laughs) avenue. Or like maybe stand with a sign outside. But yeah, now we can't even trespass according to their rules. So 
you know, I would encourage people to act outside of what the state allows us to do. And the stakes are really high right now. You know, the climate is burning and I would encourage people to take bold action, whatever that means for you to get engaged, to examine your privilege, to get to know where you are and what native land you're on and get involved in different solidarity with native communities where you are. Well, I guess on that, also learn learn skills and don't be afraid to ask questions if you want to do something more than hold a protest sign. You know, connect with groups. There's lots of direct action trainings all the time. People can find ways to plug in and skill share. You know, there's no stupid question like show up as a student. And then more specifically to plug in to the campaign, you know, people can follow us on social media. Our website is supportjessicaresnicek.com. Her last name is R-E-Z-N-I-C-E-K. And yeah, it's a pretty simple website run by a few volunteers. But, you know, it has all the details there. There's all the legal details. There's, wait, there's you know, tabs to get involved. There is also ways or the information to contact Jess and write her a letter. Like, letters are great for Jess. And you can also sign the petition. There's over 100 organizations have signed on the organization petition. And there's also individuals. Over 15,000 people have signed on. And especially now, after the appeal was denied, we're definitely in a new stage of the campaign. Like, we're going to be leveling up. So we definitely need the support of folks and you can sign up for our email lists. You can also follow us on the socials. We're on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, our Twitter and Instagram handles are at free Jess res. That's J E S S R E Z. So you can follow us along there. Um, and you know, I, we definitely don't want anyone to do an action outside of the facility that she's in, but really encourage people to, you know, take whatever actions they feel inspired to. If that's like a banner drop or a teach-in or getting together to write letters to her, that is great. We're going to be doing an international day of action at some point coming up. Um, We also, you know, had a webinar about a month ago and we had some really um, badass speakers. We had Sheree Foytland and Cindy Spoon from the Loyola B resistance camp from the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. We had folks from the Water Protectors Legal Collective who were awesome, folks from the Climate Defense Project. Yeah, so that was a really kind of comprehensive look at Jess's case. Also some friends, dear friends who are on the support team, just speaking more personally about like Jess's personality. And um, there's a lot of material within Jess's words that we have on those sites. So I would encourage people to like watch them and become more familiar with the case because, you know, what happens to Jess could happen to all of us. And, you know, protecting the water should never be terrorism. Yeah, and there's also, I was just looking at the really neat t-shirts by Kat Ang that are on the website for sale, which is pretty cool. Um, Yeah, so nice. Buy a t-shirt. Kat has been awesome. They're really cool t-shirts and uh it's the eagle and the condor myth so yeah they're great buy a t-shirt and support us and support jets the money will go to her and her education in prison so yeah are people invited to like send books or write letters to jessica and if if so like what are some things that um just likes receiving or likes talking about oh i love that question um, yeah, on our website, supportjessicaresnicek.com, you can click on the contact tab and that has the details to write to Jessica. You know, prisons are horrible and <laughs> they you can't have any stickers or, you know, there's just like a lot of details about what is allowed, what's not. And so those details are there. So definitely make sure to follow those details. Seems like Jess really... I mean, I think she likes, I mean, I don't know, talk about whatever you want, but I think her feeling solidarity, not feeling like this was for nothing. I think hearing, yeah, about, you know, dogs, she's taking care of a puppy in there. Um, Any puppy training techniques or (laughs) tips? 
Um, I think, yeah, just hearing about people's connection to place and maybe how they inspired her or uh, she inspired them. I think all of that would be super welcome and just kind of telling her she's not alone and people are really thinking about her and keeping her in their hearts. Cool. That's super helpful. Uh, Charlotte, was there anything that I didn't ask about that you wanted to touch on that you can think of? I think I would just encourage people to get involved in some way. There's so many ways to get involved. You know, if direct action feels too much for you, you know, show up to a support camp and help in the kitchen doing dishes or, you know, provide research or legal support to folks or, you know, organize a letter writing party. As I said, like there's, you know, I'm a firm believer in a diversity of tactics and, you know, we need, we need it all. We need everyone. I think the worst thing people can do is just sit back as the world burns. So I would just encourage folks to, you know, push their comfort zone and find, find a new group, find a new friend if, you know, they're not in those circles already and just find some ways to plug in in a way that feels exciting and, and nourishing for you too. Cause we need to, you know, sustain ourselves to sustain others and stand together in this fight against the fossil fuel industry and the state. Yeah, that's really awesomely put. Thank you for that. Well, thanks a lot for having this chat. And um, yeah, and for supporting Jess and uh, share our love with Jess. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really glad that you all are interested in her case. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. You will never, ever surrender or compromise! We occupied government buildings, we blockaded highways, and we talked about not just marching, but direct action to shut this shit down! Here we go the Lord! Why here we say no more? Yate, we invite you to join us for Indigenous Action, a podcast where we dig deep into critical issues impacting our communities in the occupied lands known as the so-called United States or what many people recognize as Turtle Island. This is an autonomous, anti-colonial broadcast with unapologetic and claws-out analysis towards total liberation. So take your seat by this fire and may the bridges we burn together light our way. Blazing, blazing fire that they can never stop. Find us at indigenousaction.org and with the Channel Zero Network. And now an uncomplicated conversation about conflict and movement. This originally aired in 2017. So I was hoping that you could speak a little bit to experiences that you have of um, inside of the movement that you're involved in or in political space, uh, difficulties coming up or stoppages in communication between yourself and others or in, in processes, whether it be individuals or groups that you think make, make working together difficult. I don't know if there's any mm-hmm. things that come to mind first, or if I should ask a better question than that. <laughs> um, one thing uh, pops in my mind is um, the question of time. Um, here I see um, a big difference between people uh, in terms of um, the question of efficiency and the time we we take to take a decision or make a project and often um, people um, use the excuse of emergency to to go quick to take decision only by few people and and then other people that were not involved into the decision into the process they are asked to be part of the project but only when everything is decided and uh, I feel like 
um, this is always like people always reproduce the same thing because of emergency. So is that like that's making a decision before before people get together sometimes and then just going to the meeting with a like either not not so much proposal but a conclusion. Yeah. The I see the the big uh, assembly not as a place where you discuss but a place where some groups arrive with a a decision or project they discuss only among them and you don't have the time as individual to think about it to think about other ideas so at the end of the meeting everybody the people they ask is there any idea for this moment to make a something different but you didn't have the time to think about it or to feel confident enough to expose your own ID. So at the end, it's their project of the people that decided before or talk about it before into groups that are the one that happen. Is that the kind of dynamic that could be changed if, if um, a project wanted to... If someone wanted to come up with a general um, uh, agenda beforehand, like give space and time a few days before and say, hey, so we're going to formulate things to talk about or proposals at the meeting, we're going to give this much time for like 15 minutes to talk about this, bring your proposals, mm -mm. 15 minutes to talk about this problem or this project, bring your proposals. Does that sort of thing happen in the assembly or is it less organized than that? It's less organized than this. Uh, you know that there's going to be an assembly every two weeks or every month, but um, the subject of the assembly sometimes is, uh, is said in advance, sometimes not. So you can, if you know in advance the sh subject, maybe you can organize to think about what you want to do. But it's not that easy to put people together and find what you want to do. Do you think that when you experience that, that's because people are trying to push th something through the process or because they literally just thought about it beforehand or like a, a weakness in their communication strategy? Maybe a mix? Yeah, sure it's a mix, but uh, I see I see often people that they want to push something, they have an idea or uh, a common view of what should be the struggle here and what is strategic or not, what is good or not for the struggle. So it's in a in a bigger at a bigger scale. It often responds to their way of imagining what is strategic, what is good. Do you imagine that the people that push through things don't trust? the thinking of the other people in the assembly or just view themselves as b having a different political perspective and so in competition and that's why they push it through or uh, is it simply maybe for in terms of efficiency and we have a really good idea and no one's going to disagree mm. with this so we just need to make a quick decision mm, I feel it's a bit uh, paternalistic it's a bit like um, here it's really difficult to have a common decision because so many different ways of thinking. So at some point we need to, if we want to do things here, we, we assume that some people need to take the power in, in some... It's too complicated here to do with everybody. We agree on the same strategy us as a group. And we assume we take uh, we push to our decisions, and if you want to do the same, you can do it. Actually, it's not really the case. If you want to do it as they do, um, and if you are anti-authoritarian, you can't compete because you don't want to make a close group that uh, nobody knows about, a close group with many people with lots of privileges, like class privilege, people that went to school, uh, high. Uh, high level of school, um, people that are no problem with money, no problem with alcohol. Um, so actually if you want to do the same in an 
more horizontal and anti authoritarian way, it's not possible. Can you talk about uh, other dynamics that make it easier for people to take advantage of a stage or of a platform during discussion, debate, so that, like education and, and access to money mm -hmm. or things? I would imagine, and I, coming from a different society, but mm -hmm. also a patriarchal society, I understand like gender often has mm -hmm. to do, like, uh, yeah, being male assigned, being cisgendered, like, as you identif or mm -hmm. identifying as you were assigned at birth. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you experience, like a level of comfort with taking space because of that? Yeah, I, I in in the group I'm thinking of, uh, the majority of people are male assigned people, uh, valid people, uh, people with the capacity to go to many meetings, capacity to write texts. Sometimes it's one person writing text and then saying this is collective when it's not. Uh, and in during the meeting or assembly, um, it is not the same when this is this kind of person that are quite confident and we are used to listen to because of their gender and their role in the in the community. Their voice is uh, much more mm, listen or taking into account that when, for example, you are not in this uh, category and, uh, for example, if you want to be here the same way as a woman, you have to speak loudly and uh, people think you are aggressive or stuff like this. Um, and it's much more difficult that your voice is the same importance. Does um, does ethnicity or nation of origin have any play in the dynamics too, or access to language, ease of ease of speaking language? Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. Um, the question of uh, ethnicity plays a role here. It's majority of people are white people or European people and uh, I think it's not that easy for people seen as not white. It's a bit complicated because the majority of people are white here but in the groups that are having much power in their ha ha hands no I don't know it's complicated and the question of language um, is really important the words you are able to use sometimes text they are written by this group of people the vocabulary is really like high level of language and if you don't understand you don't feel that this text is for you so it, it makes a yeah, barrier between people that who is con uh, concerned by this text or proposal and who is not part of this has have these criticisms been uh, brought up to the group of people you're talking about saying like here are some like have they been willing to hear feminist critiques for instance or class critiques mm. of how they take space or how they engage with the rest of the uh, about feminism there have been criticism and there have been an important moment where this group of people um, wrote a text about uh, women saying um, that women they just have to take the power as well and they they just have to be as strong as men and there was a big big event and people after this realized how authoritarian this kind of group can be and I think they are able to hear the critics and change before it's too too big um, but often the if you critic this organization you can they would say that you are anti everything against everything that this is kind of a complotism um, like tip, this is only in your imaginary imagination and you want to just be crit critic to be critic or um, that you are so radical and so anarchist but here it's the real world and the real world 
you have to fight and you have to be strong and we don't have the choice sometimes we have to be strategic and go quick so um, at the moment we try to have there has been lots of critics and some people that try to visualize this organization and the power they have in their hands and there are more and more discussion about it and uh, maybe there will be a change but since since now all the time it's uh, deny deny of the power domination people taking power and domination people try try not to see it or don't see it really do you think that the group is being strategic is like approaching these critiques methodically or like looking at them and saying okay somebody has proposed this critique how do i step around it like i know that some people for a long time for instance like it's so for me to hear feminist critiques has taken time mm-hmm. um, because society teaches me to think in a certain way yeah and so i need to have conversations to be like oh i see i didn't realize i was doing that mm. and that takes a lot of patience from people um but do you think that this is like uh, a part of a strategy or in this group I see that people are quite different and it's not uh, it's hetero- heterogeneous group mm-hmm. uh, some people they really think uh, they want to do things here and this is the way but they don't see how this means that many people are out of the that it's not so easy for other people to join this group if they are not uh, v- valid, if they are not uh, middle class, if they're not, uh, if they don't have to do something in this in this group, um, if they don't slow the process, things like this. And other people, I think, not the majority, they really think in terms of strategy in terms of um, maybe party, party style of politic. And sometimes I see that they come and they just listen to our critics to, to take them into, a, into account. And they will never, like if you talk with some people for one or two hours, they will not change their way of thinking at all. But they will listen. They will. They would listen and listen and listen to have all the informations they need to see what is the opposition of the way of the, the way of doing. Do you see any options moving forward to to address this and uh, this dynamic and change it or block them from doing this sort of thing? Um, I think to visualize it, to visualize that this kind of group exists, um, what it means for in, in terms of uh, power concentration, and to talk with people that are close to this group or inside this group, person to person, like you you said before, but feminist Christian to talk about anti-authoritarian and um, like think together this is possible too and some people personally I don't want to talk with them because uh, I'm not confident enough with them to talk with so I don't know what to do else but I think if more and more people are aware we I believe we can change something and change something in the structure of the community that it's not possible that few people have so much uh, power in their hands about communication, relation with media, money, um, the, f- the fact to be able to, to say what happened here, what is interesting or not, what is good or not for the struggle. So it's something we need to discuss at many people, but the first step is to visualize and talk with people around us about this. Those are about the points that I was thinking addressing that's about what I had okay yeah. is there are there other points that I didn't ask about that you'd like to um, get out or that have been on your mind 
Um, something special here is that we all live in the same place. Maybe 200, 300 people, and there is lots of uh, the question of the uh, relationship between people, and this is what makes us really strong because we we do many things together. If even if I don't agree with you uh, in during the meeting, uh, the day after we will uh, make some agriculture together. I don't know what. So this make us really strong. But the other thing is that. Um, the conflict is something we are afraid of. We are afraid that that we're not gonna get along if we talk about conflict. We're not gonna get along good anymore, and uh, it's like peace social, um, social peace. We, we need to keep good relationship, and uh, so we're not. We are afraid to go too far into the conflict, and we prefer to look somewhere else and go on like this. And uh, I don't know if it's special here, but I see it a lot in like, as a barrier to to talk about conflict and and all this. So, like with you, what you said with individuals, someone else that I talked to had, had brought up that same point of um, that it's difficult. It's difficult conflicting with people who you share space and struggle with. Yeah. Um, because you don't want it to become war. Yeah. Because then it's easy to escalate, and then not only because of the toll that it has on the individuals involved, but also mm -hmm. because for factions to go to war with each other within a movement, the movement collapses. Yeah. And then people are damaged for the rest of their life also. Mm -hmm. Do you see that there's a, a non lethal way of engaging? Just the one on one conversations about when you do this, it makes me feel this way, and here's what I think about how you're mm -hmm. doing this. That's would that be the solution? I guess that you see, or mm -hmm. I think um, I see a lot question of ego. Like people um, here really like egocentric or not thinking collectively and uh, not putting them um, self conscious of their privilege and what the space they take and the violence they can be for other people. And um, I think uh, we need a lot of uh, the capacity to listen to people and take as much time as they need. And this is what I think we like least here. And uh, yeah. the conflict can be something really interesting and we really see it as something terrible. Mm. So this is kind of imaginary around conflict that, that is terrible and this is war when mm. just people don't agree and this is politic and this is interesting and it seems really important to if things are going to move forward because you the project the struggle that you're in right now or the movement isn't in a state of war immediately mm -hmm. at the moment no. like it has been in the past but it seems like if it's not that the idea of like a peace at all costs internally is a good idea people are going to disagree like mm -hmm. you said because yeah. it's heterogeneous and people need space for that for conversations and for disagreement, but if the state comes in and tries to evict again, or if yes. something big happens since elections are coming up, for instance, mm -hmm. and people are conflicted internally, it seems like it's easier for everyone to be broken. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, y'all. We're back to the rambly thank you and asking for support moment. Hope everyone is doing well. This is off the cuff and I'm sure it sounds just like it is. But if you like the work that we do here, there are a few ways that you can support us. One important way to support us is tell people about us, uh, whether it be on social media by sharing and following our content there um, or by telling people IRL. Our content is, I think, best used in discourse. It is a discourse in and of itself. Why not double that good nature? So sharing the podcast with people, listening with other people and discussing it, printing out the PDF zines that we have available of all the interviews and sharing them with people, including people behind bars. It's an easy way for them to get a hold of the content without having access to a podcasting app. You know, you can use it for part of a reading group that you've got just to spark a conversation. Anyway, those are some ways to support us for free. 
You can also, if you have money that you want to throw away, buy some merch. We have stickers and buttons and t-shirts. Uh, you can support us via LibraPay with a recurring donation or via PayPal or Venmo the same way. You could also support our Patreon, which will get you at the level of more than $10 a month, a zine and some stickers monthly, usually some stickers kind of off and on. Sometimes the money will go towards us buying new equipment, such as the mic that you're hearing me speak on right now. But mostly the money goes to cover the transcription costs. We pay our transcribers for the work that they do. And that way we can get at least 52 zines out a year, which is, you know, in the hopes of making the information more accessible to people who have hearing impairments or for whom reading is easier than listening to content or for whom English is not a first language or for people who want to translate the information or again, to get content to people who don't have access to an audio platform such as people in prison. So uh, for all those reasons, we could use some dough. And if you can't support us monetarily but you have some sort of liberal to left radio station in your area and you like the idea that somebody might come upon the show kind of randomly in a way that they wouldn't just over the internet, you know, who is searching for whatever you're searching for. We are happy to help you try to get us on the airwaves of radio stations near you. We produce a weekly 58 minute FCC happy episode each week. We're available through the Pacifica network for easy download for lefty progressive stations that subscribe to that and uh, we have a page up on it on our website so check out our website there's you can find about how to give us skrilla at tfsr.wtf slash donate you can find out ways to broadcast us at tfsr.wtf slash radio or you can find places that you can follow us and find our content otherwise at tfsr.wtf. Thanks a lot. This is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.